All right, so let's talk about the equipment and the fridges. We will be breaking for morning tea in a, in a while, so we'll probably go for another 40 minutes or so. Now, refrigerators and vaccine storage. I really like this photo. <coughs> what do you think that is? That's a vaccine fridge. That's a mobile vaccine fridge, solar powered. Hopefully your fridges are a bit more stable than <laughs> this one. <coughs> but what are the types of fridges that we have? So we know we have domestic fridges, which are not really recommended. Bar fridges, which are really not allowed. Not a good idea at all. If you actually have a cold chain breach and it happened in a, in a bar fridge, when you call to report it and request additional vaccines to be delivered, they will not until you actually get a proper fridge. They will not deliver if they know that you're using a bar fridge. That's how serious it is. They're incredibly unstable and I'll show you a, a, a sample of a data logging. And purpose-built vaccine fridges are by far the best ones. So this is an example of which one would this be? A purpose-built, yes. Um, and they usually have a, a, a thermometer or the indicator of, of temperature somewhere where you can see it. Some of them have alarms. Some of them have alarms that are more sophisticated than others, whereas some of them will just beep annoyingly until, if there's been a breach, until you look after them or go attend to them. Some of them will actually send you an SMS. So even if it happens over the weekend or you'll get a call, yeah, go on. The vaccine is out of range. The vaccine fridge is out of range. Yes? How much are they? Very good question. The, from memory, the cheapest one that you can get, and it's a small one, it's about $1,500 plus tax. It ends up being like $1,700. Yeah. Now, they are tax deductible, obviously, and they can depreciate them over, I think it's two or three years. I'm not an accountant, but, but yeah. There, there are ways around it. And yeah, it's... it's um, it's a good idea. It's a very good idea to. How many shelves they have? How many shelves they have? That's a very good question. With um, they'll vary depending on the size. So some of them will have, you know, the smaller ones may have three shelves or so. The taller ones might have five or six. However, with the purpose-built fridges, you can use every shelf. Whereas with domestic fridges, you can't use the the bottom. You shouldn't really be using the top if it's got the freezer right at the top. So you actually, even if it's the same size, you get more space to store. What okay. is the price of the big one? Um, they vary depending on the, on the brand. So there are Quirks, Rolex, there's yeah, Medisafe, New Line. Um, and yeah, they vary between 2000 to up to 7000 for a fridge. The best way would be contacting your uh, medical supplier because usually whoever you get your medical supplies from will have um, yeah will have contacts and they'll have hire them out now as well on a lease basis ah I hadn't heard that yeah so you can actually hire them out yeah I was just told when we had a maintenance guy the other day just because we're sort of probably a look at that for more cost effectiveness because mm -hmm. and you guys store a lot of vaccines because you do travel medicine mm -hmm. so you have is it two full fridges just one big and one smaller yeah yeah we have to buy them out, right? Yeah. The, just the cost of maintaining them and the breakdown and the bands, yeah. and it's just terrible. And yeah. I stood there and said, this is awful, like mm. the amount you pay. Yeah. And that's what you said to me, but you can actually get them hired out now. Yeah, well, if you lease them, them, and again, I haven't looked into, I'll look into that yeah. option and see, but if you lease them, what would happen is if they break down, you can That's send them back nice. and yeah. it's their responsibility. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you're just paying essentially, I'm imagining a monthly fee or, yeah, yeah for hire. But then they, they, they would probably lock you into a, you know, one year contract mm -hmm. or a two year contract where you're essentially still paying out the cost mm -hmm. that it would have been to buy it. But at least in terms of maintenance time. and issues, you can offload that back to them. So it'd be, it'd be worth, yeah, it'd be mm -hmm. a, an interesting one to, to look at. Now, this is a fridge in a clinic where I work. Obviously, it's a purpose-built fridge and we have some travel vaccines here. What's wrong with this photo? The what, what, what about the containers? These, these containers are not breathable, yeah, that's okay, yep. That's one of the, you can actually use Tupperware containers, it doesn't, um, 
does, they don't have to be breathable and open like baskets. They can be, uh, especially if you have any concerns around vaccines that are freeze sensitive, the ones that are likely to freeze, which are the bulk of our vaccines. It's essentially the ones that are more uh, hardy to low temperatures are the MMR, uh, the, uh, the BCG, the tuberculosis one, and the OPV, the oral polio vaccine. The rest are all quite sensitive. So you can actually use containers. That's, that's, that's OK. The main thing is if you're going to have a uh, thermometer probe in it, just make sure that it's not one that you close fully because it's going to damage the cable. Yeah? But you can have a closed container. That's, that's OK. Um, Why do you have them? Do you mind me asking? Well, in this one, yeah, in this one is actually because they're doing, and, and again, it's one of those things that it's not a good idea and it's not best practice. And I, I had a chat. This, this has changed now. Um, there, what this says is four months, two months. So they're grouping. Yeah, they're grouping the vaccines by the 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 age or the yeah yeah. So that you have. All, why is that not best practice? Why is that a bad idea? Well, you're taking, yeah, so if you need only one, it, it, yeah, it, it brings up a lot of issues. Also, if you have to do catch-up schedules, it tends to, yeah, it's an issue. If, if someone's not actually um, needing all of those ones because they're the wrong space, place in the catch-up, then this can lead to mistakes. Yeah, not a good idea. The other thing that you'll see up here, and I had very um, stern words about this, is you can actually see a vial there. There are some in there that have been taken out of their container, out of their box, because the box didn't fit into the Tupperware container. Yeah? So many things wrong with that sentence. Yeah? So the, the actual temperature, I don't know if you can see it there, it's, it actually says 5.8, so the temperature itself is fine. The other thing that I don't like about this is here and here. Why, why would that be a problem? It's touching the wall, why is that a problem? Cold element, yeah, that's the coldest element there. So that could, that could very easily start freezing or affecting the, those vaccines, yeah? We know that we should have enough space in between for, for air to circulate, so that's fine. That's not really overstocked here. It's probably a bit overstocked up here, especially because what's happening here? That's your fan. So very likely, this is probably, and I have to do a mapping of this fridge. By mapping, I mean tracking, yeah, tracking the temperatures, so getting the, um, a thermometer up there or doing a data logger up there in different levels. My guess is going to be, this is probably going to be the coldest shelf, because this is where the cold air is coming out from. The other thing is the vaccine fridge temperature, it's only really reading one point. Yeah, so you might go, oh, this is fine. It's 5.8, but in, I don't know where this probe is. The probe might be up here. So it might be 5.8 here, but by the time, if this is a really congested fridge, by the time it actually gets all the way down to the bottom shelf, it might actually be around 10 or, yeah? That's what we want to get to know our fridge. And we don't need data loggers for that. We can just use thermometers and just, yeah, double check. At the same time, put them in the same place, leave the door closed and see how they're tracking along. It should be very close to the same temperature. It should really be within one degree. Yeah? Some tips. Let's place the ones that are freeze tolerant, so the ones that can tolerate going to zero, like the MMR and the OPV and the BCG, as we said before, closer to what we find out or we will find out are the coldest places or the coldest shells in our fridge. We're not to crowd the vaccines um, or by overfilling the shelves. We want to have at least a four centimeter gap from all the fridge walls. That's why those vaccines touching that wall, not a good idea. We want to keep them in their original box. We want to do that self audit every 12 months. How much vaccine, and I get this asked a lot, especially when you have a new nurse coming into a clinic, they haven't worked in general practice before, going, I need to do stock ordering. How much do I order? We should only really have one month supply. Why is that? In case you have a breach, at least it's only one month and not the half of the year worth of stock that is now 
going to have to be discarded. Yeah? Um, there's actually, in, the, in your guidelines, there's actually a uh, formula to calculate how much to order. Does anyone know what that is? So the formula to calculate it, and I can't remember now off the top of my head where it actually is. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. Yeah, it's page 16 of your Strive for Five. So the way you calculate how many, how many vaccines to order for your month is you calculate, so let's say we have a, um, say let's use flu for example. The flu is not a great example because <laughs> it's quite seasonal. Let's say um, our, even the pneumovax tends to be um, ADTs, yeah? Let's say with the ADT, the tetanus one, we had 10. We, the first thing we want to find out is how many did we use last month? So over the last month, how many did we use? If last month we used 10, yeah, then this month what we're going to do is, okay, we know we're going to need, we're going to need this month, we're going to need 10 plus another 10% as a backup. Yeah, so it'd be 10 and one more. And then we minus what we have left in the fridge. So in the fridge, if we have, or we had done an overstock or over ordering, and we had already, you know, we had 15 in there, then we don't need to order anymore. If we had two, and then, then we know that we only need to order none. No. Now, we know that they're going to give us the box that has yeah, the set amount. But that's just an example so that you get an idea. So the way we do it, we check how many did we use last month, add 10%, and then take out however how many you have already in the fridge. That's how much you need to order. Is that clear? Yeah? You have the cheat sheet anyways in the, in the, in the guidelines. And we talked about this, do not put the, uh, try and avoid having the refrigerator against an outside wall or in direct sunlight. Why direct sunlight? Because some of them are light sensitive, but also because direct sunlight will affect the temperature. Yeah? Get heat right on it. Good. So we chat about thermometers. So we should all have a thermometer which can either be the one that's built into the fridge, yeah, if we have a purpose-built fridge, or a standalone one that you move around. What are the things that this thermometer needs to have? Any guesses? Minimum and maximum and current. So we want to know what's the current temperature, what's the maximum temperature that it's reached since when? <coughs> since it was last reset, yeah, that's what it'll tell you. And what's the minimum temperature? that it's reached since it was last reset. Sometimes people get confused with these ones, because especially the, the, the ones that you buy of your medical supplier and that you can move around the fridge, because it usually has an in and out temperature. What's that about? The ambient temperature outside. And yeah, so there, and it'll, give you, it'll give you two different sets of temperatures. It'll say in, and it'll give you a... Um, 22 and then out and it'll give you 8. They can be quite different. The difference is, and again like double check that this is the case with your particular thermometer, if it's the one that's already built into the fridge it's not an issue. It's more for the ones that you move around. You'll usually have something like this. So this is actually a data logger but it looks a lot like the thermometer. You'll have the thermometer and then you'll have the cable and the probe. Yeah, which in this one, as you can see, where is it in? Box. It's in a vaccine box. Why would I put it in a vaccine box? Because it mimics the conditions that our vaccines are actually experiencing in the fridge. Yeah, so it'll say when it says in, it's actually talking about in in this device. So it actually has two thermometers. One is measuring the actual device, and the out is out on the probe. Yeah? So if I have my fridge here, and I have my thermometer here, and this is inside in the fridge, yeah? The in temperature, this is outside the fridge, the in temperature is in this device. This is actually giving me the room temperature. It's very counterintuitive, isn't it? But the out temperature is out in that probe. The probe is actually the one that I want to find out about, because that's the one that's in the fridge. 
Yeah? <laughs> the thing is, a lot of these thermometers, they're actually, if you think about it, vaccines are not the bulk of the, the, the um, business for, for fridge thermometers. What do you think it would be? Food. Food industry. They have to look after cold chain just like we do. Yeah, obviously they have different ranges for their meats and veg and all that. And so for them, they have the same setup where they have that inside the fridge and out of the rope. That's why it's not as intuitive for us with vaccines. But no matter. So always make sure that if that's the setup with your thermometer, that you're measuring what? The out or the in? The out. Out on the probe. Yeah? Out on the probe. So usually, see here, it's, this one's got mode. So we click mode and that will probably go in or out. In, out. It'll give you, um, when you say max, it should give you what's the maximum temperature. Make sure that's a max out. Yeah? When we say min, it's the minimum temperature. Make sure that that's the minimum temperature out. Yeah? What do we do once we, we write down the current temperature, minimum, and the maximum? Reset it. Reset it. What happens if we don't reset it? <coughs> you're going to get the, the reading the day before and then after a week you're going to get the reading from, yeah, which is not as useful. Now I just wanted to talk about if we do, if we are using one of these thermometers, we can't do this with the purpose-built fridge thermometer, but if we have a freestanding thermometer, yes we can. And I would highly recommend that even if you have a purpose-built fridge, even if you have a data logger, still have a free thermometer that you can move around. Why? Because if you do ever need to put your vaccines <coughs> into a cooler, say you have a breach of some sort or if there's a power outage and you need to move them to another container or if you need to take them out for a flu on site for a, I don't know, a workplace or something, you're going to need to be able to monitor it along the way. So they're not that expensive. They're around between 40 and $50, I think. And they're quite hardy. The only thing is make sure that you change the battery every year. There is a way to check the accuracy of that thermometer. Does anyone know what that is? Yes? Slurry the slurry test. Yep. How does that work? How have you done in the past? Oh, you use this, this iced water. Mm -hmm. and you, you're looking at your minimum temperature yeah. and it registering um, properly. Yeah. And then you know that the we put it in the fridge. Yep. So what we want to check. The way we do the slurry test, for those, then that's actually page 22 of your Strive for Five. The way you do the slurry test is you can get a, um, a little cup, a polystyrene cup, fill it with two thirds of water, and that can be room temperature water, put it in the freezer. Yeah? We want to leave it up in there probably for about an hour or so until it starts getting a, a little film of ice. Yeah? Because that's when we know that the temperature in that in that water is going to be around zero degrees. If it starts getting ice, it's going to be around zero. So it just has to have a, 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 a shallow um, little ice surface. Then what we do is we take that out, but make sure that it's been in there for at least an hour or so. Well, if you have a really potent freezer, it might then just freeze the whole thing. We yeah, <laughs> want to check in on it. Pull it out, we'll put the probe in um, all the way in, it probably won't have as much, this was the only diagram that I could find of it, um, probably won't have as much ice as this, but you put it into halfway, make sure that it's not touching the sides of the container. Why would I not want it to touch the sides of the container? Because it might give me an incorrect reading, it may not measure the water, it may actually start to measure what the, the, um, the cup actually has. And then what reading would I want to see on my thermometer? The current reading should be zero, or it could be plus one or minus one. So it can have one degree of either way. If it starts giving you a three or a four, now how long do we leave it in there for before we can check that temperature? You should actually leave it in there for at least two minutes. So leave the probe in for two minutes. And at two minutes, check the temperature. It should be zero or plus one or minus one. That's how we know that the thermometer is giving us an accurate temperature reading. What do we do if it gives us a 4, for example? Can you recalibrate them? 
Oh. Um, can you recolor bright them? I, I personally don't know how to do it. There's a, there's a quicker um, way to check what could be happening there. Change the battery. So let's change the battery first, because a lot of times we won't be able to calibrate this ourselves. We might have to then send it back and, and dramas. Yeah? <laughs> so save the dramas. Change the battery first, do the test again. If it's still all over the place, that thermometer is no good. Yeah? <coughs> we clear? Good, good. All right. Let's have a quick chat about data loggers. Now, data loggers come in very different ways, shapes, and sizes. So these were some data loggers that we have from before. And as you can see, with these ones, this one I've labeled bottom. And this one's also bottom. This one's top. What could that mean? When you're, yeah, so if you, if you have multiple, so same with thermometers, you can actually put them in different levels and just track how they go for a week. So that way when you, what happens is with these, they will track for however long you put them in for. You can actually program them to your computer. They'll connect via USB to your computer. And you can program how frequently do you want it to take a, a measurement of a reading. Yeah. So you can say, I want it to, to read, to take a measurement every five minutes. Every five minutes do a snapshot of what's the temperature in the fridge now? What's the temperature in the fridge now? What's it now? So you can actually set up for, say, a week, week and a half, or a month. It should really be a week or you can do it for three days or whatever, where then you get a, a nice list of readings, which you can often turn into a graph of, OK, what was the temperature of the fridge? So you can see over, over the day, from 9 AM, it was, it was fine. It was, and then as 11 AM came in, obviously, one of our GPs who loves to open the fridge and leave it open while they're deciding what to buy from the <laughs> fridge, um, the temperature went up to. 10 or 12, yeah? And then they, but it only really went up to that for five minutes or so, and then it came back down, yeah? What's our, our temperature range that we said that's the recommended range? Mm -hmm. Plus two to plus eight, yeah? Why is the guidelines, why are the guidelines called strike for five? Because <laughs> it's right in the middle between two and eight. So if we're aiming to keep the fridge around that temperature, we're pretty safe. Now we are allowed, to go up to 12 degrees for up to 15 minutes while we're doing stock control and all of that, OK? What we don't want it to do is we don't want it to go up to 20 degrees or anything crazy like that. We also don't want it to even sit at around 12, 15 degrees for more than you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Because with the ones that get, um, all vaccines are going to be heat sensitive to a, a degree. And that's cumulative. So the more time that they get and that hotter end of the spectrum, the more their viability starts to go down and down and down. And that's irreversible. So what's happened here? Have any of you had breaches in your clinics where you've called the Department of Health and you've been given the advice to what? What type of advice have you been given? Just to use it within a certain for different so change the expiry date for some, use them within the month, or use them within, yes. And that's because of that. They'll do a calculation of, OK, how much time would they have been in that hotter, yeah, hotter environment? And then they recalculate to say, well, the, probable, the viability of these vaccines is going to be safer within this time frame. Okay. Different vaccines have different time frames. Yes, yeah. different vaccines have different time frames. Now, have you ever been told to discard vaccines? Yeah. 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 Uh, and that was from heat or cold? Heat. heat. From hot, yeah. Usually, if vaccines reach zero, the bulk of them, just by touching on zero, will need to be discarded. So I'm always a lot more paranoid about a fridge that's sitting around flirting with two degrees and three degrees and then tipping down to one than one that's sitting around the six degrees and seven degrees. I would prefer it be on the top end of the five than on the bottom end. So if they hit zero, we're out. Not for all of them, but the majority. 
Yeah? All right, so as we said, the, the data loggers allow us to get to know the hot and cold spots. We can print out our report for the week or the three days or however long. And it allows us to double check that, in fact, the, the readings that we were recording, that the temperature that the thermometer was giving us was accurate. Yeah? The other advantage, as we said, is it lets us see, which the, te the thermometer doesn't. Like, the thermometer just tells us how high or how low it got. But it doesn't tell us for how long it was at that temperature. Yeah? So we might see that our, at the end of the day, when we do our second check of the day, it says that the maximum temperature that it reached was 14. Now we can go, yeah, this GPO, we did do a stock check or ordering or, or something like that. Or this GP often you know, has that bad habit or, of leaving it open while they're getting things. But you can't really be sure if it wasn't at 14 for over an hour or something. Which is why having something like a data logger that's your backup there um, gives you that peace of mind. Here's the thing, if overnight, you, at the, the second reading of the, of the day, you reset that thermometer, you come in first thing in the morning, when it should have been reset to, say, you know, six degrees or whatnot. So that should be now your new max and your new mean. Come in in the morning and it says 15 degrees. What could be happening there? Why would that be a concern? The power may have gone off during the night. There is no reason why this fridge should be getting so hot during the night when no one's opening it. It makes sense that it might go up during the day because people are opening it and moving things around. But if we reset it, that's the advantage of doing twice daily checks. If we reset it at night time and we come in in the morning and all of a sudden, uh-oh, this is getting too, too hot. It gives us a um, <clears throat> reason to, to explore. Now, I don't know if you can see this um, all that well. You'll be able to see a little bit. This is one fridge that we did a logging. This is two degrees, so plus two to plus eight. So that red line and that red line, that's our range. And that was two loggers at um, top shelf and bottom shelf. So the lighter reading is a bottom shelf, the light gray, and the dark black is the top shelf. What's happening there? One is, yeah, one is definitely sitting consistently hotter than the other. But then here what happened? They're kind of all over the place, yeah? This is actually a domestic fridge, yeah? It was actually quite stable though, but it's stable in the very, very top hotter end. It should really be doing that <coughs> around here, yeah? Now let's have a look at a bar fridge. So this is our range, eight degrees and two degrees. This is our zero. Keep in mind, all thermometers will have a plus one, minus one degree of inaccuracy. So just because the thermometer is saying that it's sitting at one, it may actually be zeroing at zero. Okay? So what's happened here? So you're seeing that this is going from, yeah, this is multiple days. This is over the course of a week. There doesn't really seem to be a lot of consistency. It just kind of goes down and then goes up again. And this is partly because the room and the temperature, sorry, the temperature in the room was going up and down and that was affecting the fridge. Other things like if you have an air con on or if you have a lot of multiple electronic devices on and that's sucking power away from the fridge, even if it's a purpose-built fridge, sometimes they'll struggle because they're competing for electricity. So that's another thing to, to see. If your fridge starts struggling in, in winter when you all of a sudden have the heater on or in summer when you all of a sudden have the air con on, that's something to keep in mind.